those um, new things. As it was mentioned in the previous panel, affiliate marketing is at the cornerstone of broker's marketing efforts. But recently, this industry has experienced quite a few hardships. We all well heard of the new regulations that are putting more and more constraints on the affiliate practices. And the price of acquisition, something that we'll discuss in a minute, is constantly, constantly growing. On the other hand, we see new technology that is already implemented within the various systems and quite a few future ones that are expected to boost affiliate marketing. So, uh, we have with us the distinguished panel. I will give you guys a chance to introduce yourselves and then we'll just move on to the questions. So, Sarafina, please. Thank you very much, Michael. Um, hello, everyone. I hope you're having a fantastic afternoon so far or a day. I mean, this conference is one of my favorite ones. So. Hopefully, uh, it will be yours too. Um, my name is Serafina. I uh, come from PaySafe Income Access. We're a digital marketing company that's been specialising in affiliate marketing since 2002. So, hopefully, we'll be able to share some insights with you. Great. So, hello everyone. Uh, my name is Omar. I'm working for Swisscode Bank. So, Swisscode Bank, we are the Swiss leader in online banking. Uh, we are specialised in uh, multi assets. Uh, trading solutions for uh, private investors and financial institutions and uh, we're going to launch uh, pretty soon our uh, affiliate marketing program so on June 1st uh, to boost our retail and client acquisition. Happy to be here this day with you. Well, uh, I would like to welcome everyone here. My name is Alexi and uh, I work in Tick Mill. I would, I would like to thank you all for dedicating your time and coming here instead of spending the time on uh, sandy beaches of uh, Limassol. Um, I've been dealing with partnership programs of all sorts for quite some time and hope I will be able to actually kind of share my experience um, with regards to this uh, side of the work that every Forex broker will have to be involved in. Thank you. Hey guys, thank you for coming. I'm Sean, I'm from Tel Aviv as well. Hope you're enjoying Cyprus. Beautiful country, really like it. Okay, it's good. Anyway, we are an affiliate network named Traffic On. We are already 11 years in the industry. We have a self organization system that knows how to split with an AI technology, knows how to split between all the brokers and get them the best high quality leads. Also, it's written everywhere, ABC is king, that's our motto, that's the most important thing for affiliates, you know, affiliates are asking all the time what's the CPA, what's the CPA, everybody needs to understand that ABC is the most important and that's our logo, ABC is king. Thank you guys. So, we're going to start with a very basic question that might look a little bit funny to everyone, but it still needs to be asked. So what is affiliate marketing today? We need like a, a strict definition because there are a lot of new models coming in and I just want to hear from you what do you define as affiliate, as an affiliate and in general affiliate marketing practices. So, so you know. Um, that's a very good question. Um, I, I guess for us a definition of an affiliate would be a, a third party marketing partner that's referring customers to your business. Now they could be an individual with Website, it could be IDs, it could be brokers that have a network, it could be somebody with a big social following, it could be an influencer. I mean, it's, it's anybody that's not yourself that's marketing your business to drive customers to you. Well, yeah, I uh, completely agree uh, with what you're recognizing. So, on our side, uh, we really see the, the affiliates as an external uh, sales force that we remunerate upon performance. So. Uh, for Swiss code, actually, we really see the, the affiliate as a complementary program uh, to our existing introducing broker network. So we work with a lot of IDs in Europe, in the Middle East, in Asia, and uh, we have different uh, commission models uh, with those IDs. But for us, the, the affiliate is really CB, I mean, should be CBA focused, so really uh, rewarding the affiliates based on the performance, on the client acquisition and uh, not necessarily on the impression or CBL, uh, some deals that we can have generally in a direct way with, uh, with external media. So this is where, how we position uh, the affiliates in the media landscape. Yeah. Well, I basically agree with Roman and uh, with everyone who expressed their opinion. However, within uh, this panel talk, 
I would like to say that I personally am going to refer to affiliate as their activity which brings your business regardless whether it's based on uh, client acquisition or any other criteria. So basically, in my opinion, as I said uh, during today, um, I will basically be referring to whatever you do uh, to maintain your business partners, to bring to generate the business partners who will be capable to bring traffic to you. Well, basically, what I need to talk about Thank you guys. So uh, I want to direct a question to Alexei as, a, as one of the representatives here of uh, Learn Pro Garage. So we're kind of still in the, in, in the midst of the storm that is called the ESMA uh, regulations and restrictions. How did the ESMA regulations, the recent ones I mean, uh, how did they affect affiliate marketing practices? Uh, and if you can go into details in terms of numbers, in terms of how this uh, affected your uh, uh, efforts and your partner's efforts. Well, I would say that I have an experience um, talking to people who work in various brokerage companies and I can say that currently we have faced pretty much the same um, situation everywhere. Um, major there was a big impact once the ESMA rules were implemented and there, but it was kind of a funny impact where you, can, you could see that there, on one side, there was a shift of people uh, who were working as introducing brokers. In other words, they were remunerated for the volume generated by their clients. There was a big shift of those people to uh, less regulated brokers just for the ease of uh, using their trading terms and using their partnership uh, uh, terms. They simply are wanted to apply their existing business model but to the new broker since their existing business partners, existing brokers could not support them any longer. So they would say they would exchange uh, their existing broker to another one hoping they, they can make as much as they were making before. On the other side there are some people coming from, uh, majority of them would be coming from uh, European countries they did not want to compromise their um, business activities. Therefore, they uh, started seeking for those brokers who were, which were capable to offer them these uh, affiliate-related terms, which is like compensation ba based on traffic brought to this broker. That's why, um, as I said, er, the situation is a bit funny. On one side, you can see a big shift of the um, IBs, introducing brokers, all kinds of partners to less regulated brokers just because it's easier to work with them. On the other side, there are some people coming from uh, very decent countries that uh, they care a lot about their reputation, about uh, their business, who do not want to jeopardize their current activities and they are looking for their good broker capable to um, partner up with them without breaking any local uh, business requirements or any local laws. Uh, can you give a specific example of the hardships that uh, the IDs are experiencing? Like, give me like one All right, um, we have a situation. Uh, as you know, before, uh, one of the very common uh, practices were, uh, was when uh, an IB was remunerated for certain volume traded by clients referred by these IBs. Uh, these people cannot be compensated, compensated based on this uh, business model any longer due to, to the ESMA regulation. Therefore, they are forced to either change their um, compensation model and agree on working with a one-off payment, which a lot of them don't want to do, or they have to find a broker which is capable to offer them CPA, CPL, or something similar which there are plenty and uh, my colleagues here, they are coming from the industry, they can uh, basically um, probably support me with it. 
So uh, I would say there, there are a number of worries. Maybe during the first half year while ESMA was, uh, was in place, I would probably say that maybe 50, 60 percent of the businesses, they shifted away from uh, the model where they were compensated for volume as a, a so-called IB programs. And these people are seeking for different brokers. So that's pretty much what happened. Well, I know that, uh, look from your side with regards to ESMA regulations. On our side, we will have the ESMA program since the ESMA implementation. But uh, if we take all the acquisition channels that we work on, actually, we saw in the ESMA region uh, a drop of the account of earnings, for instance, uh, about, about 15%. And if we talk about the, the revenue that we were generating before and after the ESMA implementation, uh, we saw a sharp of 40% uh, in the key markets that were running business uh, with our office in London. So, of course, the, the, the new regulation, you know, with the, those negative risk warnings that you must put on your website, on the different creatives, uh, the leverage now, which is cap, uh, I think it's, uh, it's reshifting a bit uh, our industry both, uh, from both uh, uh, from a brokerage house perspective, uh, but also from a partnership perspective. As, uh, as you mentioned, I said, it's clear that uh, yeah, the people who used to work on a, on a revenue sharing or revenue compensation basis in the past, in the ESMA region, I don't, I don't see that much future for this uh, at the moment. So we must work on, uh, on new formats, and maybe the, the CBA is, uh, is an alternative, which might be uh, more interesting. Yeah. So uh, I'll take you on a uh, follow up on the CBA issue. And Rafin, I want to ask you: CBA has been skyrocketing over the last ten years, and, and more so over the last five years. So is there an end to that? Like, do you see somewhere where the prices are going to stop? And uh, how do you see uh, the purchases in the future with such high prices? Um, it's a very good question. I think the, the base for what you do with your CPA models or any compensation model for the first time is you have to also you have to know what your lifetime values are. So you have to know what margins you're prepared to work with and which partners are going to bring you the you know high revenue generating customers and therefore you've got more room to give them a higher CPA. I think the one size fits all rule doesn't work. And you know, my experience that really does not work. So you have to be very selective and yes, you might be able to go high and high and high for better quality, but you also have to be prepared to change the model if it's not working in your favor. Sean, what do you think about uh, the CPA prices? Is there any stop to that, any end to that? Well, no, I think that of course not. Can I have a word here? All right. Um, first of all, just a quick definition. CPA, it's a cost per acquisition. It's how much a broker is willing to pay for a client who decided to trade with this or that broker. It's just for the people who might not know what it is. Anyway, I would agree that in the recent few years, the cost of CPA, how much uh, commission the broker would pay one off, did really go far from, if not mistaken, they used 500, 600 dollars for a, for a client it used to be kind of like considered to be quite high payout. Am I correct? Yeah. Now I'm seeing there are some brokers they would agree to pay 700 bucks for a client, 800 dollars for a client, and what I'm seeing right now, uh, some interesting things are happening. First of all, a gap between um, payouts to for clients coming from, let's say, not so wealthy countries such as. Uh, let's say um, maybe Egypt or Eastern Europe and pay out to, yeah, and some others and pay out for clients who come from well-established countries which is, let's say, Australia, Singapore, um, Germany, Italy, Norway. I would say Germany, Italy, Norway, I believe it, cor believe it correlates very much to the 
the, the, the drivers of the economy in Europe, I mean, uh, the gap is growing. So these people who come from these countries, they are being rewarded for the most. And when I did my math, I would say that even though currently some brokers pay $700, $800 for a client like that, they will be willing to pay even more. And I will not be surprised that this number will double because uh, it's a very lucrative market, I mean, these countries. And even though the broker will pay more, they will still be profiting. On the other side, what's going to happen is that these high payout, payouts will basically cut off those brokerage com uh, companies who are not capable to pay that much. Therefore, there will be brokers capable to offer this model, and there will be brokers who are not going to play in this game at all. That's my opinion. So, following up on what you said, I want to ask Sean, uh, we, uh, you mentioned quite a few countries here, let's say, so I, I want to know, in your uh, point of view, what are the most lucrative geographical locations now in terms of ROI uh, in affiliate marketing? Which countries? Well, it's like... I'm still looking at women, I know which ones are like something different. <laughs> no, 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 I'm joking, seriously, back to the question. Uh, I think there are no blackwood materials because for each brand has different publishers that brings in different ROI for each geo. And geos, you know, they really are making me the best ROI, well, the ones that are making me less ROI, really depends. Um, from my personal experience, um, I've been in this business for just a few years though. Um, there are um, the brokers and these brokers would have their core business based in just a few countries. And to my surprise, I experienced that sometimes the companies would be generating lots of revenues from some countries you would never expect them to. For example, I had cases where there, there were the companies uh, getting a lot from some countries in Eastern Europe, despite that you would never think of it. So, uh, you may not only say that uh, there is this gel which is more luc lucrative or less lucrative, however, of course, there is potential which is much higher, let's say, in Singapore other than Pakistan. It's more profitable to, to work in uh, Germany or UK other than in Bangladesh, that's obvious. However, sometimes for a company to survive, it's good enough to actually focus on a specific market where you have pretty decent setup which allows you to do the business. That's number one. That's from my personal experience. You don't have to agree with me. Um, on the other side, I would say that um, it's not only the geo that matters a lot. It's also your ability to offer enough IT solutions to support your staff, and it is also um, you as a broker who is, who is capable to motivate the staff working for you. And if your people are motivated enough and they're supported enough, and I'm not talking about some fancy things, the basic things, so if your people are supported enough and motivated enough to do the business for you, almost any Jew can be profitable and quite lucrative for you. That's my opinion. Thank you. Uh, so, Roman, I wanted to ask you, uh, uh, following up on the issue of new models and new uh, approaches towards affiliate marketing, uh, what do you think about prepayment? Is it a model that you're familiar with and uh, doesn't it kind of goes against uh, the whole idea of affiliate marketing? Yeah, so, uh, no, it's not a model we are, we are used to. Uh, as I said, uh, uh, today on, on a global scale we work with a lot of IVs. Uh, so we have different models with IBs. We have two, two major actually uh, commission plans. One is about uh, offering rebates on spreads. Okay, and this uh, this model is uh, mostly used uh, in, uh, in Europe, in the Middle East, in Switzerland, uh, our market. And then we have another one which is more market oriented. So it's really specific to the Chinese markets uh, where we are uh, where we are pretty well established. And uh, here actually most of the IBs they are signal uh, sellers. Uh, they provide education uh, to their to, to their uh, to their clients, and they just apply a markup on top of the spread that we charge to the clients for trading on our platforms. So this kind of uh, uh, commission scheme is is completely 
near the opposite of the, the upfront payment. And for the, the, the AFL program that we're going to launch, it's not either uh, in our philosophy for the moment uh, to pay them from the affiliates, as I said. We clearly see it as, a, as an external sales force that we're going to reward on a, on a performance basis. So once the client is on board with the deposit and with a minimum of trades, uh, that must be executed on the platform. So at the moment on our side, it's, it's not really the, the philosophy, so we, we, yeah, we, we, we're not going to apply it. Yeah. Mr. Fina, what do you think, and uh, as a follow-up question, what, what do you also think about uh, some profit and loss models? Some, some kind of rupture and loss share models that we have now? So just to add to what Roman said, I think I totally agree. Prepayments used to be quite common in the past with you know bigger affiliates who really know the traffic very well. Um, but prepayments usually come with some sort of a performance criteria. It just the, the notion prepayment means you're giving them the money up front before you actually get the customers and the traffic. But it's it really boils down to if you work it back to the same CPA values that you're, you're comfortable to pay, then you could do that. Um, profit and loss is a good one. I mean, in our experience, a, a good affiliate program should always have an element of a revenue share with it. And the reason I say that is because when you have a revenue share, your affiliate is actually like a business partner. They're not just looking for who's going to give them the highest CPA because, yes, I mean, not this is what's wrong. Um, affiliates can be fickle, they'll just look for who's paying the highest money and send the traffic there. But the people who pay the highest are not always the ones who convert the best. So you, you have to be, be sensible about it and look at it from a profitable model. Um, again, when it comes to profit and loss, obviously you can have a CPA element because obviously advertising costs money and they say they can't, you know, pay and they don't send, you know, PPC costs money anyway. So it's good to have that, but the long-term element of it is what really makes it a sustainable, profitable model for both the broker and I wanted to ask you, uh, Sean, let me start with you. Uh, there, there are all these types of uh, new products, new technologies that are uh, now emerging. Uh, so what do you guys have, uh, uh, what kind of, kind of a new product that you have that you implemented lately and you can tell us about it? Well, basically we have the AI technology. Uh, I suppose that uh, people are familiar with it. We use it for our smart building. So all the brands that we're working with, we get the lead from the traffic from the FDA. Basically the lead enters in the same second based on the call center or the geography and which conversion rate, the lead is getting redirected to the brand that is going to be most highly converted. So we use AI for that. And yeah. That's all the technologies that we should have used. So, you know, any new technologies, new products that you uh, would like to mention? Um, I think well, what we normally see now is obviously most people are on their app, on their mobile phones. So, being able to do your trading very easily and seamlessly on a mobile platform is really the, the way that we're seeing it. And from the affiliate perspective, obviously, if the affiliate is going to drive traffic to your app, then they need to be able to track it. So being able to track the in-app activity ongoing, not just a one-off, is uh, something that's quite, quite sought out there. Okay, so, so we talked about technology and we mentioned buzzwords like AI. Uh, another buzzword that uh, we neglected to mention is blockchain. So my question is how can blockchain, if, if any, can improve the trust between brokers and affiliates and you know all the agencies in the middle? Obviously, we know that there's some sort of tension sometimes. Uh, and can blockchain technology with its verification and its assurances uh, serve as a bridge to, uh, to assure all brokers and affiliates? So let's see. Let me... uh, first of all, I want you to say that um, majority of the people sitting here they are much uh, smarter than myself, therefore you probably understand the word and the concept of blockchain much better than myself. <laughs> My opinion well, again. Alright, I'll try. Um, so, uh, in my opinion, uh, blockchain, despite that it sounds uh, like it's some fancy and very uh, complex word, um, at the current moment and maybe within the next few years would not really have much impact on the industry because um, it's 
it's being based on uh, same technologies as, uh, I mean, their affiliate part of the business has been based on the same technologies as we've been having for the past three, four, five years. Nothing changed really. So it's the people who need to have to be backed up. They, the people do the work for you. Having uh, all these technologies to help you somehow, somehow uh, segment your clients, kind of identify something, yeah, that's good to have, but it's not their driver for your business. However, uh, in my humble opinion, uh, in case these uh, blockchain and technologies based, ba technologies based on blockchains are, will be capable to somehow help your uh, needs, solve your problems, I don't know, do the KYC better, uh, identify the clients better, yeah, they might be playing some great role sometime in the future. Uh, Roman, what do you think? Yeah. Um... I, I think uh, it's not really the, the, the technology which can, uh, which can improve the, the choice between partners. If you do business with partners, you must first start to trust them in the first, uh, in the first stage. Uh, and at the second stage, then, I, see, I see huge potential for the technological aspect of the blockchain uh, to improve the, the different processes. So I'm really thinking, for instance, about the, the payment part. Uh, I read an article recently, uh, it was a guy uh, who actually uh, saying that uh, maybe implementing a smart contract uh, protocol, you know, which is based on Ethereum, uh, could be a nice application of the blockchain uh, to settle the different contracts between uh, the counterparties, so between affiliates and brokers, for instance, and to settle uh, the payments once the transactions are, are verified. So this, I see, I see a strong potential uh, from that side. So really gaining you know, uh, efficiency and removing maybe all this manual, uh, manual work part, which is sometimes uh, very, uh, yeah, not, not very interesting to do and which does not really have value. And uh, from still in the payment, uh, in the payment side, uh, there is also this, uh, those initiatives, uh, you know, from RippleNet. So this network, which is now adopted by more than 200 financial, uh, financial institutions worldwide, and this also uh, could provide much more efficiency, could save money, could go quicker uh, when it comes to, uh, to manage global payments. So if you have huge networks of affiliates in different, uh, in different continents, when you have to manage different currencies, again here this blockchain technology can really improve uh, the, the way you process all those payments, uh, can save the cost, uh, but uh, it's, it's really a, a technological matter. Uh, I see the trust. Uh, it, it's completely human based and uh, it's all about the, the relationship that you have with your, with your partner. But blockchain can be a great asset uh, for it, obviously. Yeah. In my opinion, what happens is that the majority of the companies uh, that work in this business, they are being managed, managed by um, some conservative people who are trying to uh, build their business kind of like slowly but surely. Therefore, I don't really think that these people will be rushing to start a new technology straight away. They will probably take time, try this product, try that product, see how the competitors did it, and they then, if things went well, they will apply this product. It will take time. So yes, uh, there is big potential in this, but at the same time, it will take time before these new products will be actually widely used. Thank you guys. Um, we have very little time, but I do want to open the floor for one question only. Anyone? Go to the ones, go to the CPA. Anyone? Okay. Thank you guys so much for this great discussion. It was our pleasure. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.